Beyond the Mic with Sean Dillon. We're joined on the star line by author of Noise, Living and Leading When Nobody Can Focus, Joe McCormick. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Let's go Beyond the Mic. Joe, how did your time at Loyola University influence your writing? Well, I did two things when I was there. I was an English major, so I wrote a lot. And I was a journalist, so I wrote for the school paper for a number of years, so I, I spent a lot of time writing. As a journalist, you see the noise that is all around. It was easier in the early 70s and 80s when there was three channels of TV. There was no explosion of cable news and 500 channels and websites and all sorts of information. How do you eliminate the distractions, the noise that is around right now? I think the first thing that people need to be aware of is that there's a proliferation of information. It's constant. 24-7. So people can really spend most of their day consuming information. And that wasn't the case, you know, maybe 20 years ago, where now not only are our minds divided, but really our lives are, to a great extent, largely defined by consuming information. The premise of the book, Noise, is a lot of that information is really not that relevant, and a lot of it's useless. You talk about empty calories of useless information. How hard is it when there are so many, quote, truths, unquote, around. You know, you may have someone say the sky is blue. No, the sky is red. No, the sky is black. How do you focus and get to the truth? If you look at the modern age today right now, the answer is quite old school. It's start saying no. There, just because you can doesn't mean you should. So there's, you know, a time and a place for consuming information, just like there's a time and a place to eat. In the analogy, like if you're, if you're consuming information all day, it's like eating all day. Well, we have breakfast and we have lunch, we have dinner. Those there are set times to consume food. It's important for our health. The same thing for us mentally and emotionally is like we can't consume information all day, so we have to set limits and at times say, no, I'm not going to check that alert or that notification, or if it's after 7 o'clock, do I need to be on email until 1130? And a lot of that stuff becomes a compulsion and not a decision, and I think saying no can be a big start for people. How does fear of missing out affect people's desires to be handcuffed to their phones, handcuffed to their devices? It's all based on a hope. It's all based on the hope that I'm going to find the next big news story or the next big thing, and I'm afraid that I might miss it, is ironically tied back to the same expectation when people gamble. If you go and you play like the, 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 the one-armed bandit, and you're, you're always you're like one more pull, one more try, I'm going to win the jackpot. The same thing with information consumption. People are afraid that if they don't try it one more time, they're going to miss something. My suggestion is look back at all of those times when you did it. Did you actually find it? And the answer is really not. I mean, if you look at an hour, look back in an hour, I've just spent an hour online. Did I get it? So spending five more minutes going to make it happen? Probably not. Your first book, Brief, Make a Bigger Impact by Saying Less, tackled the concept of less is more. How do you balance the need to know with the, you really don't need to know? I mean, the, uh, the, one of the big things it comes down to is relevance. If I'm, when I'm communicating, I always have to be thinking, how is this relevant to the person I'm talking to? I'm sending an email to a person. Why is this important for them? I'm, I'm going to blast an email out to 50 people. Is it important that all 50 people? So is it relevant is the question I think people should ask themselves. And then in the, in the premise of the book brief is not only is it relevant, but have I made it really clear? Have I made it concise and meaningful versus just, you know, overabundant and, you know, 7,000 words where I could have t- done half amount of time. So is it clear? Is it concise? Is it relevant? Becomes ways to tighten the message in the same way that I think journalists do, which is I, only, I don't have an unlimited attention span with my audience. I need to be able to communicate the most important things in a shorter span of time. We're living in a generation where millennials, given devices to you, be used as babysitters, now overshare. They're using TikTok, their Facebook, their social, their Snapchat. They overshare and overshare and overshare. How hard is it now that that genie is out to pull it back in as parents now being able to say, no, you don't need that device. No, you don't need to share that. I'm not against technology. Technology is a great enabler. It's a way of us be connected. There's so many benefits to it. I think what surprised parents in a great way was how pervasive and how powerful this technology, accessing this technology for the kids would be. I think one of the first things that parents need to do is to realize that they need to set the tone and set an example. Recently, I had a conversation with with a guy who 10 years ago was his father was complaining to him that he was on his phone all the time. Well, 10 years later, his dad's on his phone more than his kid. 
So it goes both ways. So I think parents have an obligation to set the tone where if they're getting home from work, maybe check that last email before I walk in the door and I'm off my phone. So setting examples is very powerful. And then having a discussion with your kids like, this is an issue. We have to manage what I call noise, a lot of this information, or it's going to manage us. So have a conversation about it. Talk. Don't just have a random rant with your kids like, shut it all You know, Let's sit down in a moment of calm and, and set boundaries, set limits. Maybe there's rooms in the, in the house that we don't, that are off limits. Certainly the dinner table is a place. Maybe after 8 o'clock in the evening, we try not to be on the phone. And I think setting some limits that go both ways can go a long way. Another issue that people struggle with, and one I struggle with myself, is the balance between work and home. For a lot of people, it's very difficult because they work at home. I think the difficulty is, it's like anything. I go, going back to the analogy of eating, I think that when you work, you work, and when you're at home, you're at home. And I think that being able to say no and, dis, and being more intentional about, I'm at home with my family, and I need to be present to them, Technology goes with you wherever you go, and a lot of that technology is work-related. I think shutting it off, leaving it at the door, maybe in another room. But when I walk in the front door of my house, I need to be present because now my role is no longer professional. And I know that people feel like we're always on, but sometimes, like businesses close, the same thing. You know, businesses open at 9 o'clock, they close at 6 or 5, whatever. I think the same thing is we have to set store hours for ourselves. Like, okay, my job is done. Now my, my job as a parent has started and not trying to have those lines cross as much as possible. It's hard, but it's, it's I think, something that we have to set more as, as an intentional goal. One of the things that my wife and I do when my kids are in town is we all put our devices inside a box in the living room. And the first person who asks to go answer a text, a tweet, a phone call, and picks their device up from the box has to do dishes. How do you limit the time with your devices so it isn't a punishment? It's more a time where families can come gather together. So there's a number of things. I think first and foremost is is these are strategies to manage this so it doesn't manage us. So this is a part of our lives, but it doesn't mean that it runs our lives. So I think starting with where do we put the phones when we come in the house is one place to start. Another place is just when we're together as a family at meals, when we get into the car, check the phone, put it under the seat, put it in the side pocket. Another thing that families can do very simply is, is setting like, I call it the seven to seven rule. So after 7 p.m., these are basic guidelines, right? You don't have to go crazy, but after 7 p.m. and before 7 a.m., we don't check the phone. So it's like I go to bed at night, I put the phone in a different room, I, I put it far away from me, I don't use it as an alarm clock, and we start to use very practical ways that, hey, I'm managing this, as a family, we're managing it. It's part of our lives, but it's not running our lives. And I think that distinction for people will make people feel encouraged. Like, hey, this is a part of my life, but I have a plan of how to manage it. I'm not going to throw out the window, though sometimes I might feel like that. And I think people will regain control. Like, all right, and that was the point of writing the book, Noise. is like, I'm not going to have noise run my life. I'm going to start lowering the volume. Talk about your work with The Brief Lab, and what are some of the resources that you offer at thebrieflab.com? The Brief Lab is a business to help people communicate clearly and concisely. So it's for professional communication where people have got to deliver the point. So we teach both corporate business leaders and then military leaders, because I work a lot with the military, about how to get to the point when they're delivering a presentation, a conversation, or a briefing. Talk to us about your podcast that you have, Just Saying. Yes, I, I do a lot of work with the military, specifically special operations. And about a year or two ago, they asked me to develop a podcast. So it's just short little tips, 10 to 12 minutes, that extends the conversations and the coursework we do with them to keep them strong and getting stronger when it comes to communicating uh, concisely. Time's running out, so it's time for the Rocky and Eight. It is the first thing that comes to your mind, no pressure. When was the last time that you caught yourself being distracted? Uh, this morning. I was in a meeting, and I just, I just daydreamed for a second, and I caught myself, and I came back. What's the thing that distracts you the most? Uh, thinking about my family. Favorite place to vacation? Uh, North Carolina. Favorite book? The Elements of Style by Strunk and White. Who was the last family member you talked to? Uh, my brother, Matt, yesterday. Last sporting event you went to? I went to a White Sox game. Last person you said no to? person I said no to was my admin yesterday. And your favorite pair of shoes is what? Um, Merrill hiking boots. 
He is the author of Noise, Living and Leading When Nobody Can Focus. Where can people find the book? Quite simply, it's at noisethebook.com, and there's resources and links to, to purchase the book there. He's author of Noise, Living and Leading When Nobody Can Focus. Joe McCormick, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And that, my friends, is Beyond the Mic.